Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to this activity organized by the English Teacher Education Program. Today, we are pleased to introduce Jente Koppelman. She is going to talk about her home country, the Netherlands, in terms of relevant aspects about it, such as culture, education, and traditions. Jente is an international relation ex exchange student coming from the University of Groningen. She's currently doing a minor in journalism psychology and so, 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 <laughs> sociology, yeah, sorry, at Universidad de la Frontera. We are glad to have her here today. Let's receive her with a round of applause. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Before I start, I want to thank the faculty of Pedagogia for having me and for inviting me to do this. And also, uh, and especially Oriana for guiding me and helping me so much with everything. So, and of course, for you guys being here and people watching via the Zoom, I really appreciate it. Um, so before I start, I want to introduce myself a little more. So can, <laughs> can you please switch to the next one? Thank you so much. So my name is Jente Koppelman. I'm 20 years old. In exactly a week, I'll be 22. Um, I come from Groningen, the Netherlands, and I study international relations and international organization, and I'm in year four at the moment. Um, I am doing my exchange here, just like uh, he explained, and my hobbies are gym. I go to the gym very often, rowing, I travel, and of course, hanging out with friends. I have some international experience. I'm very fortunate to have traveled to the United States and Asia. And that's also part of the reason why I really wanted to do the presentation today, because I feel like there's a lot of um, goodness that comes from sharing culture and sharing experiences. And one interesting fact to start, I'm quite short for a Dutch person. So <laughs> maybe that's surprising since everyone here is about my height. But no, in the Netherlands, they're all very tall. All right, thanks. So before we start, this is a map of Europe. I wonder if any one of you know where about the Netherlands is. Can you please raise your hand if you know where the Netherlands is? One, two, three, <laughs> four. Yeah, there's not very many people. Well, can you please switch to the next one? There it is. <laughs> it's all right here next to Germany and Belgium. So now you know where it is, where we're talking about. All right, what you might know from the Netherlands, I mean, I've been here now for almost four months. And in the four months, um, people have responded in three ways when I said I was from the Netherlands. It was either, oh, the Netherlands, that's Amsterdam, right? <laughs> um, so you might know it from that. Mm, I don't know where the slide went up. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, next, please. All right, yeah, <laughs> of the marijuana. I mean, the Netherlands is known internationally for being one of the first to legalize marijuana. So that's also what a lot of people know the Netherlands for, or even visit it. And the last one is the red light district. <laughs> also, yeah, I see someone nodding in the back. That's what we're also known for. But today I'm here to tell you that there's a lot more to the Netherlands than only these three things. So. Next, please. Yeah, perfect. So I want to tell you more about the traditions we have, the way we're organized politically, the history we have, the culture we share, the waterworks, and also a big part about education and how our education is formed and how the system actually works. So next one, please. Perfect. Okay. First, I want to talk a bit about the history. I have some notes here because I, I don't know really everything about the history as well. But I first want to start with the colors of the flag. That's red, white, and blue. And um, the, originate, the colors originate from the 80 years battle against Spain. It's a long story, which I will tell you in a minute. But the opposing and the rebellion provinces that wanted to be independent from Spain chose the, the Prince of Orange color which were orange, white, and blue. And then in the, as the years progressed, the orange turned into, into red. So that's why we have the colors as we have them now. Next one, please. All right. So 
first a bit about the 14th century. Um, the areas where the rivers, the Rhine, Maas, and the Schelde meet was known in the Middle Ages as the Lage Landen, the Netherlands. And the center of gravity in this time was of the Bulgarian Netherlands, was in the south, around the Brabant, that's what we call it. And um, at this time in the 14th century, um, there was trade in cloth, leather, and seasoning and spices. And there was also brewing, fishing, and shipping, a short and a rapid economic rise. And then the 16th century, there was a rebellion against the Habsburgs. <laughs> and um, the Southern uh, provinces united and made peace with the Habsburg King Philip II. And when Spanish troops conquered the Southern Netherlands in 1585, the border between the North and the South was definitely fixed. The, Nord ne the Northern Netherlands was given the, the form of government of a republic, which worked well. The small country of less than 2 million inhabitants soon became a world economic power because it specializes in agriculture uh, and trade and was thus able to increase its productivity enormously. In addition, the interaction in, of shipping trade and the financial sector worked very well. All right, now we go to the Spain time. Um, when the throne of Spain, Spain was also part of the Habsburg Empire, was to fall to the French Philip of Anjou in the 1700s. The war of the Spanish succession took place in which the Netherlands also took part. This war made it clear that the small Dutch Republic would not be able to maintain its supremacy in the long run. But when uh, Governor William, William II died in 1702 and left descendants, the representatives of the provinces ruthlessly decided to take, retake office. And after the French invasion of the subsequent unrest, the House of Orenier, it's a French name, <laughs> regained a position of power. And this was very successful. And the societies briefly seized power at the end of the 18th century and renamed the Dutch Republic of, of Bat Batian Republic. Okay, next one. All right. Then in 1806, Napoleon Bonaparte occupied the Re Republic of Batavia. And in 1810, it became the French uh, department. And in 1813, it was a successful uprising against the French occupiers and a new provisional government was formed. And the result was that the Southern Netherlands, today's Belgium, was occupied and united with the Northern Netherlands. And, the last one, and then we go, we make a jump in time and we go to the First and Second World War, which were very significant in Europe and also for the Netherlands, because the Netherlands resided uh, neutral during the First World War. And in 1940, the German Nazis invaded the country as part of Hitler's Blitzkrieg uh, strategy. And um, after the surrender, the Queen returned back to the Netherlands in June 1945. And they initiated the Benelux Economic Union, where the founding members of NATO, as well as the European Economic Community started. And that's where the European Union that the Netherlands is still a member of originated from. Thanks. All right, now I want to talk a bit about the political organization and the structure of the Netherlands. So this map shows the provinces in the Netherlands. In total, there are 12 provinces. I'm from Groningen, which is the red one all the way in the north. And um, the way that the Netherlands is structured is that in the west around here, South Holland and North Holland, that's where the most people live. That's also where Amsterdam is, the economic sector is, the harbor is. So that's where everything is located. And yeah, so the way we organize our country is quite complicated. So I'll try to make it as easy as possible. Um, <laughs> so basically every province has a region and the region is um, organized in the form of a gemeenteraad, which is a board that's led by a burgemeester, and they make local decisions. So that's purely the decisions for each region. And then when you zoom out a little bit, you see that there are provinces, and the provinces are organized by the provinciale staten, which are elected by the people. And um, they go, they make decisions about everything that happens in the province. And they also elect the people in the first chamber in the, in the main government system. And then 
um, the, the main decision making happens in the parliamentary de democracy that we have, where civilians vote for the representatives that end up in the Hague. And that's um, where the main government is situated with first the ministers and state secretaries, which makes the main plans. Then they have to um, present that to the first chamber, which is um, the chosen by the provincial state, the provinces, and also the second chamber, which is chosen by civilians. So basically in a very simplified way, we have a lot of um, voting systems to make sure that the democracy is um, kept safe and enforced. And then, of course, we're also part of the European Union, so we also have to oblige to all the laws and rules that are presented by the European Union. And then there's also the monocle aspect of it. This is King Willem Alexander and his wife, King Maxima. Um, yeah, they don't have any power. <laughs> they are just there uh, to cut ribbons, basically. And um, one important thing that they do do is that they have uh, state visits to our neighboring countries or countries that we have relations with. And then this is a picture of the, we call it a Bordes photo. It's made of the cabinet each year. And yeah, it's hard to see, but this is Mark Rutte. He is our prime minister next to the king and everyone else in the government. Um, so yeah, that's in a nutshell, the political organization. Netherlands. Ah, okay, now I'll talk a bit of it about culture because I think that's also where a lot of people are here to know more about the culture. And to start off, um, we're internationally known for art and artists. I think the names I will mention now, I'm pretty sure you've heard of it before. So we start with Vincent van Gogh, which is a very internationally well known artist and is one of his masterpieces is the starry night i think everyone has heard of this before and next one please yes and the second one is rembrandt van rijn and his masterpiece is the night watch it's originated from 1642 and it's very popular that's now in the rijksmuseum in amsterdam and you can go and watch it and yeah, I think this is one of the most famous paintings from the Netherlands. I think everyone knows this. I'm curious, does anyone know this painting? No? Okay. <laughs> Miscalculation then. <laughs> All right, and the last one is Escher. And he specializes in this very, like, I don't know what the English word for it is, but he masters in like this conception, I think it's called, where you look very long at a painting and still have no clue how it's structured. So that's basically what he does. This painter is called uh, Relativity. And yeah, it's very popular in the Netherlands. You can also visit the Escher House. It still exists. All right. And now a bit more about the food. So the Netherlands is not really known for its food culture. I mean, of course, I think everyone knows France, from the cheese and the baguette, but the Netherlands is not really known, but I promise we have really good food. <laughs> and these are a few examples. Uh, I'll start here. These are called stroopwafels. I've heard that they sell them too in Chile as well. And it's basically two cookies with caramel in between them. Then raw haring. You basically eat it like this. You hold the fish up and then you bite it. And we also have bitterballen, which is a fried snack. Uh, with meat on the inside and this is a very old dish from the history but it's basically mashed potato with kill and a sausage and some bacon or gravy or people do it whatever they want it doesn't look very appetizing but i promise it is and then my personal favorite that i had to include it's called frikandel special and it's a frikandel with ketchup and mayonnaise inside and it's really good. So if you go, please try. <laughs> okay, next one, please. All right, and then a bit more about the culture and the holidays. One of the holidays, this holiday is coming up quite soon, actually. It's December 5th. 
And basically it's called center class. And this is a children's facility mostly, but all uh, adults participate in it as well. And it's basically a story about this man. It's called Center Klaas. And he's a very old man that comes to the Netherlands in December every, every time. And he is here to bring gifts. So um, he has helpers, which are called Swarte Pita. And they help them to spread basically um, gifts to all the children and adults in the Netherlands. Well, of course, it's very real. <laughs> And on December 5th, um, we call Pakis Avond. So that's where all the gifts are dropped off at all the houses. And um, leading up a few weeks to Pakis Avond, we have something that's called Schoentje Zetten. And the children basically take their shoes, put them in front of a fireplace. And during the night, magically, a gift appears in the shoes. <laughs> and one treat that we like to eat during this holiday is paper noten which is basically little cookies. It's really tasty. Um, one thing to mention here is that lately, I think over the last five years especially, there's been a lot of controversy around this subject because um, it's um, a lot of people think that this, this tradition is pretty uh, like racist and there's a lot of discrimination happening because um, the Swarte Pete, the helpers, um, they are painted black completely. And also, their outfit. Um, there can be seen similarities between their outfit and the slaves um, that were uh, many years ago. And we still dress up like that until a few years ago. And that's where a lot of protests happen because everyone has an opinion about this. There are basically two groups opposing each other, saying that either it's a tradition, it's meant good, it's for children, we should keep the tradition the way it is. And then there's also the side that says, this is very racist because there are basically black people dressed as slaves helping a white man. So that's where the controversy comes from. And that's where a big discussion is still happening. Nowadays, the Swarte Pieten are um, dressed in the same clothes, but they are not completely painted black. They just have some black smears across their face because the story is that they come through the chimney and that's why they're black. Um, so yeah, that's still an ongoing discussion, um, but still it's celebrated and uh, children like have a lot of joy celebrating this for sure. So thank you. And yeah, the other holiday and tradition that's very big in the Netherlands, it's called King Day um, of Koningsdag. And that's where we celebrate the birth of our king or queen. Well, now it's the king. And it's on uh, April 27th at the moment. And this is where the whole of the Netherlands dresses in orange. Why orange? That's because um, in the name, the full name of our royals, there is uh, orange, oranje. And that's why we, to celebrate the, the king, we dress in orange. And as you can see, people go out on the street, they celebrate, they go in boats in Amsterdam. And it's a big festivity that takes the whole day. And we also celebrated a lot of time with flea markets that children uh, sell their own, like their old toys on, or they perform with their guitar and they try to make some money. And one thing we eat during this day is called the oranje zompoes. And it's basically a cookie with some, like two cookies with green in the middle. And it's really good as well. So if you want to dress up in orange, definitely go on April the 27th to Amsterdam. Yeah, okay, then the Dutch people, how are they like? What do they do? Well, one thing we're internationally also famous for is our biking culture. Everywhere we go, if it's the school, grocery shopping, taking the kids to school, doing everything, we do it by bike. It's very common, it's very fast, and it's also very ecologically friendly, but that's not why we do it. Um, so yeah, if you go to the Netherlands, you see it everywhere. For example, I used to bike to my high school for 45 minutes and that's what everyone did. <laughs> so yeah, we would just go from our village to the big city, all in bikes and it's very normal there. And another cultural aspect is going Dutch, meaning that the Netherlands are kind of known for being kind of 
cheap. <laughs> so we like our money and we like to spend it well. Um, meaning that if we go out for dinner, for example, it's very normal that we both pay our own half. It's not normal that someone takes you out to lunch. And this is also, of course, a big discussion while dating, because then who pays? <laughs> Uh, and then also the people are known to be very direct we like to tell it as it is we're not trying to be rude but we just tell it like it is um, also a big difference from Chile is that we give three kisses to greet someone not one <laughs> um, for the rest we're very active people we're very um, curious about everything we like to entrepreneur we like to be active we like to go to see the world and yeah I think that's a way we can describe the Dutch people for sure. All right, and then I want to talk a bit about the international fame. So how the Netherlands is known internationally and the things were um, very popular for. So one of the things is cheese. <laughs> um, apart from, of course, their art and the artists, I mean, that's what a lot of art knowers know us for. But then there's the cheese. I think the most popular cheese we have is the Gouda cheese. And um, one thing you can visit, it's very touristic. But in the old days, there used to be cheese markets where they would run around basically like this with white outfits on and a hat and this kind of swing that the cheeses are located in. And that's how they would transport the cheeses to the cheese market and across the market. You can still visit it. It's not common to do it anymore. But as a touristic attraction, it's very fun to watch. And yeah, we made a lot of money, basically, um, trading cheeses. We also call it our yellow gold um, because it's just very good cheese and everyone wants it. <laughs> and on average, the fun fact is that a Dutch person eats about seven pounds of cheese a year, which is quite a lot. It's very uh, common to eat cheese on bread, just plain bread, put cheese on it. And that's for a lot of people their lunch. <laughs> so that's actually a fun fact. All right, then the tulips. You can see them everywhere when they're in season. They're basically big colored fields of them. And they're also very beautiful. Um, one fun fact is that there was topomania. In the 17th century, a lot of people invested in the tulip bulbs in the Amsterdam stock. And a lot of foreign investors bought the bulbs to plan them and to have them as an investment because they were very popular in the 17th century. Unfortunately, the market collapsed, leading to a pretty big economic recession in the Netherlands. So that's unfortunate. But we still grow them and now they're also a big income for the Netherlands. So that's what we're still very known for. And then as the title of this presentation already said, we're very known for the waterworks. The Netherlands is the country below the sea level, meaning that we have to protect ourselves from the water. And that's what we became internationally famous for as well, with one of the biggest things being the Afsluit Dijk. It's basically like a big dike going from two parts of the country and connecting them. And what you can do basically now is just drive across it. And it's a big dike just in the middle of the sea. It's very impressive to drive across it as well. It's about 32 kilometers long. And it's built between 1927 and 1932. It was a very hard process, of course, to build. Because, um, well, structurally seen, it's very hard to build something in the middle of the ocean. Um, a lot of people also died during this process of building. But nowadays, we've expanded it internationally into our trade. Next one, please. And we also have it in the south a lot. This is the province called Zeeland. And it's called the Delta Werken. In 1953, there was the North Sea flood in Zeeland, which took a lot of lives. And that was one of the main points where we decided that we really needed to protect ourselves against the water. And so we built something that's called Delta Verka. And it's basically a system in which the, sea, uh, the water levels are regulated by the government. Um, so there will never be any floodings again in that area. 
Yeah, and the other thing when it comes to waterworks that we're very uh, popular for, it's called inpolderen. It's basically a process in which we turn water into land. And that's also how we build a whole new province. So this province that you see in green here, that, what, that didn't exist, we build it. And the process is done by mills, which is also a symbol for the Netherlands. Every second. Thank you. So I'll try to explain it as easily as possible. This is actually also told to all the children in elementary school and high school how this process works. But basically, it starts here. You have water. And what they do is they build a dike around it that's higher than the water. And in the old days, they used to place a mill on top of it. Nowadays, they do it a bit more, a bit more modern with gemalen, it's called. But what the mills did basically was pump the water from the low place to the higher place. So to the canal that was built around the dike to basically relieve this whole area of water. And then they could build land and they basically would repeat that process over and over to build land as it is. And that's also why we had a lot of mills. Um, nowadays, of course, we have technology and it's a lot easier. But that's basically where the mills come from in the Netherlands. And internationally, we're also used for this very process of waterworks and land and water, the combination of the two. So for example, Van Oort, it's a Dutch uh, company. It works in Dubai and builds islands and lands and everything basically the people in Dubai want. But that's what we're very internationally known for. Yeah, so these are the mills, one more time. And they're also used sometimes now as like, um, well, not now, but in the old days as like um, graining uh, grain, how they call it, to make flour. And um, but yeah, nowadays they're just for show a lot of the times or for tourists. <laughs> and then of course here in Latin America, we're also very known for our queen, Queen Maxima, she's from Argentina. So a lot of people, of course, know who she is as well. All right. Um, lastly, I want to talk about the educational system. Um, I've heard that people in Gila are very interested about that. So I want to tell a bit more about it. And to do that, I, may, I didn't make, but I found this scheme basically that explains it all. Um, I think one thing that's very... Uh, primal and uh, very uh, central in our way to approach education is the way that we look at what students want, what students need. And that's where we made our uh, education system on. Excuse me. All right, so we started primary school. Basically all the children go to primary school from years four to 12. This is very similar, I guess, to Chile. And after the children turn 12, they go to secondary school. And this is where it starts to get complicated. <laughs> the levels are different. So not all children go to the same school. They go to the different levels of school that are all specified for something else. So this is more theoretical. This is less theoretical and more practical work. So here people are told how to cook, how to do technician things, how to basically work very practically. And then we have another level, it's called HAVO. This one is five years. And this is a bit more theoretical, but still not very theoretical. And then we go to FEVIO or gymnasium. And this is where People go to school six years, and this is pre-university education. So that's like the most theoretical we go. Um, and every child, every child basically does a test, a test to see what they are good at, but I'll explain a bit more about that later. So how is it set up? So you're obliged to go to school officially from the government from age five to 16. When you turn 16, you're free to do whatever you want. Um, however, a lot of children already start at age four, some even while well, they're almost turning four, because parents like to be very early with education. 
And we also have different schools. We have public schools, special schools, which are mostly religious schools. So for example, Christian ones and private schools, but they're very few. I know in Chile, it's quite big, but in the Netherlands, it's not as big. We do have them, but it's not as big. And the Dutch grading scale runs from one to 10. So imagine I was surprised when coming here and I had a five on my test, because <laughs> that in the Netherlands is called, is not enough to pass the course. And lastly, the system is made and specifies toward the needs of the individual children. So that's why we decided to have the different kind of schools, because for example, people that are more skilled in doing um, like manual labor, we don't want to put them through very uh, technical, uh, we want to put them through a technical school and not another um, like you know, pre-university school. Um, so we want to look at the talents that every child has. That's what we base our whole system on. All right, so how do you get from one level to the next? So in the Basel School, the primary education, we have a one test at the end of the uh, school and when the children are 12 years old, and it's called the CITO test. That's basically a test that tests all the subjects. So um, basically math, languages, reading, everything to determine uh, a score. And the score says a lot about, what well, we say the intelligence level of the child. And together with the score of the CITO test and the um, recommendation from the teacher that knows the child, know where the child good is, good in is, we either send them to FMBO, HAFO, or FAVIO. And then everyone goes through their own secondary tragic. So this one is four years, five years, six years, and everyone ends with another exam. It's called final exam, Eindexame. And this one, uh, this exam is um, combined with other tests during the career of the children during school, what states their final big score basically. And that determines um, if they are, um, if they know enough during secondary school to basically close their high school time and go to either their secondary vocational the Hogeschool or the university. And yeah, and basically when you go to university, we end with, uh, of course, a grading list and also a thesis or a final project. So that's the way we go from one system to the next. Yeah. So the CITO test is also uh, yeah, a few days to determine abilities and intelligence. And yeah, together with advice, it determines the level of high school that they can go to. And the final exam, the IIT exam at the end of high school is an exam that tests all the knowledge and material that was taught during their high school. And one thing here is that um, it, um, yeah, the results of the test may determine the future career opportunities of the student, but it doesn't have to. Um, and one big thing, again, that is made so that all the talents of the children are being used to the full is called Fakkenpakette. So basically, in, after the third year of high school, uh, everyone in HAVO, IVO, they choose a curriculum that can be culture and maatschappij, which is culture and society that emphasizes for languages. Um, they have mathematics, but it's more on focused on statistics. And this profile prepares for a more artistic and cultural uh, training. Um, then we also have Economie and Maatschappij. My Siri also has an opinion about this. Um, then we have Economics and Society. Um, and it advise, uh, emphasizes social sciences, economics, and mainly history. And also the mathematics are more fo focused on statistics instead of the hard math. And then we have Natuur en Gezondheid, Nature and Health, and it em emphasizes biology and natural, natural sciences. And here the mathematics are more focused on the algebra, geometry, and calculus. And if you want to do, if you want to, if you want to become a doctor, this is what you at least need to do. So that's a big thing for everyone that wants to become a doctor. They have to choose this. Or the last one, uh, nature and technology. 
and it also has a big emphasis on natural sciences. And the mathematics are also more focused on algebra instead of statistics. And also this is more, uh, this is the profile you need to attend technological and natural science training. Yeah, so basically that's the way we um, make our system so that every talent is used. And in order to go to university, you need to finish uh, either a VWO level or the gymnasium level. The difference between the VWO and the gymnasium is that in gymnasium, um, the children are offered more things uh, extra, such as um, another level of math or uh, Latin and Greek languages. Um, so you need to have finished either of these two to go. Um, you're free to apply to any university and program in the Netherlands that you want to follow. And each study program has its own set of requirements that students have to conform to. So, for example, you need a special FACA packet that we talked about. Just, for example, if you want to do uh, a technical study, you need nature and technology. Um, and then also additional tests might be required or the universities look into your resume or grades. Um, and for some studies, a test is required and for others, you just need to apply. And main bachelor is three years. Yeah. Um, and there's also another way you can get into university. If you go to ABO, there is a way for you to work up to the university level as well. So if you didn't do FBO, but for example, HAVO, there's still a way for you to get into university. You just have to go to, H to HBO, HBO, finish that, and then you can go to university. So that's basically the educational system in a nutshell. And then to finish off the presentation, I wanted to give you a few tips on what to do or what not to do when you travel to the Netherlands from a Dutch perspective. So if you want to integrate in the local culture on your holiday when you come to the Netherlands and use a bike, please reconsider, especially in Amsterdam, because it's a hazard. <laughs> Dutch people bike very fast, very aggressively. So be careful if you do it. Yeah. So the Dutch people speak excellent English and sometimes even Spanish. That's one of the languages we get told. So you can even try to speak Spanish to some people if you want to. Please go outside of Amsterdam. There's way more to the Netherlands than only Amsterdam. Uh, try the food. And even though the Dutch people can be a bit direct or seem a bit grumpy, they're really nice, really curious. So please <laughs> look beyond that. Be on time. I know in Chile, the being on time is uh, not as important. Um, I'm very bad at it. My English teacher, is, oh, sorry, my Spanish teacher can contest to that. But it's very appreciated if you show up early to a meeting. And lastly, contact me if you come to the Netherlands so I can show you around. So this was the presentation. Bedankt and tot ziens. And yeah, if you want to contact me, here's my email. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Yeah. How did you end up here in UFRO? And did you come here through any uh, international program or scholarship? That's what I uh, would like to know. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, I came here for multiple reasons. My personal reasons to come here was to practice my Spanish a lot. Um, I, in the studies I follow, international relations, um, we have to study a foreign language uh, because that's very useful when you are studying international relations. And I chose Spanish for that matter. So that's why I came here. And I am also very interested in um, like the Latin American culture. As I said, I am very privileged that I've traveled to Asia. I've traveled in Europe. Um, but I hadn't traveled to Latin America before, so I, I was really interested in the culture. And then lastly, the nature. I'm, I love nature. I love visiting places. And I think Chile is the country in the world then to visit. And yeah, on the more technical level, like how I came here, was that um, the University of Groningen offers a lot of um, like opportunities to go abroad. 
So basically, um, any student can apply to go abroad. Um, and in my studies especially, because we have to do a minor, and you can choose the option to do a minor abroad. So um, they have a special grant for that. Within Europe, it's called Erasmus Grant. And outside of Europe, uh, Europe it's called Marco Polo Grant. And you can apply for the grant. And most of the time, you'll get it. It really depends on the income of your parents, of course, and everything. But um, yeah, it's, just, it's not as big of a grant. It won't cover all the costs, but it will be enough for you to get here. Does it answer all of your questions? Perfect, thank you. Are there any questions? No? Ah. I would like to know, first of all, thank you very much for being here. It was very, very interesting and it covered most of the things that uh, we don't know about um, the Netherlands. What's the, conf I mean, because uh, we say Holland and we say the Netherlands. So, uh, but when I went there, they know this is the Netherlands, not Holland. Can you explain that to us? <laughs> yeah, of course. So um, that's a bit about the history of the Netherlands. So in 1855 um, till 1759, the Netherlands was called the um, like the Republic, wait, I have to watch into my notes because of all the years, I'm not that good with numbers. Uh, yeah, from 1588 to 1795, there was an area that's now called the Netherlands. It was called the Republic of the United Seven Netherlands. And the Republic was conquered by French troops. And um, in, in 1795, it became the Batavian Republic. And Napoleon appointed his brother, Louis, to become the king. So that's when the Netherlands became a kingdom. And in that kingdom, um, Holland was like the biggest contribution to the economy. That's what the gravity of the economical center was. So then everyone referred to the kingdom of Batavia as like the Netherlands, like Holland. So, and even after Napoleon, Holland stuck with everyone. So now, it's still a common name to call it Holland, but actually when you say Holland, you're only talking about two of the 12 provinces and not about the whole country. So even though you can say Holland, like people know what they're talking about, but Países Bajos or like um, the Netherlands is the official name. That's what we are called. That's basically it. Any more questions? No? All right, thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for your presentation. And I am very curious about how well your teacher knows you as a student to, along with the test you take, determine what high school or secondary school you go. How is that? Can you explain? Um, yeah, well, the discussion started that taking a test would be... Um, will be like a very limited view on the student's abilities because, I mean, there are many students that test bad but are, but are actually very intelligent. So yeah, of course it can be discussed that the teacher doesn't know anything. There are a lot of smaller schools and villages. And in that case, sometimes students are in classes like for three years. So basically grades um, six, seven, and eight are combined in one class. Then the teachers know the student very well. But if they're only in the class for one year, yeah, then it can be argued that the teachers don't know it very well. But in general, I think, um, well, in my personal experience and the experience I've heard around me is that students generally are known well enough by the teachers to make an indication about their focus in class, the way they behave in class, and also the intelligence level that they might have. So. Um, and also, of course, the, the teacher knows the results from all the tests during the last year of school. So I think all those factors combined is where um, the teacher makes an indication of how and what. And it's mostly that indication comes to use when the um, CITO score, like the score that comes out of the final test, is lower than what the student probably can do, um, based also on the results of the test. So I think when you take all those factors together, that's how the teacher's opinion is um, like included into the advice of the high school. Yeah. So 
um, I was wondering, what if a student is a late bloomer? Like they don't figure out what they want to do early during the education process. Uh, can they change where they have been uh, assigned? Um, yeah, mostly, I think the, the majority of the students actually stick with the level that they chose and that came out of their final test. However, of course, you have people that go into puberty early and don't want to study. For those people, there's always an opportunity to um, go uh, like higher in the educational system. For example, you do VMBO, which is one of the, it's called, yeah, lower levels. Um, you can always work your way up. And the same is with going to university. If you go to HAVO, which is not pre-university education, you can always work your way up, go to, to the HBO education and also work your way up to the university. So there are a lot of opportunities to change any education course if that's necessary. And okay, let's think that um, it is a very, uh, for me, at least for me, it's a complicated system because I'm not familiar with it. But I imagine students getting a lot of pressure from uh, deciding in an early stage their future. Um, is there any mental health issues for the students? Um, I don't know the specifics on that. I cannot tell you any numbers. Um, what I do know is that um, people can feel pressure by the system. Um, I think, I mean, I have to talk about the stigma there is. I think in the Netherlands, there's a big stigma as well among students that people that go to the lower levels of education, so not the pre-university education, they actually are being called stupid sometimes. And the people that do pre-university education are called like nerds and they're boring. And so there's a lot of stigma. I'm not familiar with the mental health issues. Um, what I do know is that amongst university students, I mean, especially with the pandemic, lately there have been a lot of um, mental health problems also before the pandemic, because um, one thing about the educational system is that there's a lot expected from students. So if you cannot make the cut, you're out, basically. Um, we have very harsh lines. So um, I know that that's a big thing. Um, but that also, on the other hand, helps us to become very achieved as well. But I know that that's been an issue as well. But I couldn't tell you about high school. So. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Yanta, for your excellent presentation, sharing with us valuable information and for inviting us to discover the wonders of your country, which connects us a bit more with globalization and knowledge of other cultures worldwide. As you know, this is the fifth and last presentation that our program has carried out. Thus, we are really pleased and thankful for all your support attending throughout all of our conferences. Once again, we would like to thank Yenta for her participation and motivation and you for your attendance and interest this time. Thank you. <laughs>